The Charleston Literary Festival Young Writers Award recognizes students with exceptional talent while promoting the transformative power of literature and encouraging creative growth. The awards begin as a writing contest where submitted works are adjudicated by a dedicated panel of literary professionals. The works selected for recognition are based on three criteria, originality, skill, and emergence of a personal voice. Three works are selected for the categories of fiction and nonfiction for a total of six awards. In addition to a cash prize and certificate, award winners also receive a literary festival tote bag stuffed with generous donations from Buxton Books, the Gellyard Center, Charleston Stage, and Charleston County Public Library, with special support from Ms. Jen Comer and, for future years, Ms. Patty Manigo. Thank you. Our awardee today is Acadia Reynolds, a junior in the creative writing program at Charleston County School of the Arts. Her accomplishments include several scholastic awards and first place in the Septima P. Clark Poetry Contest. She was also the division winner of the South Carolina Council for the Holocaust Art and Writing Contest, and her work has been translated into Spanish and German. Her preferred genres are horror, poetry, and sci-fi. She's currently working on a psychological horror story. Mm. <laughs> the judges' comments include from our own Harlan Green, who will momentarily be on stage, that uh, Acadia Reynolds' short story, Summer Days, is a dramatic situation handled effectively. And from Natalie Huff, the deputy, a deputy director at Charleston County Public Library, that Acadia Reynolds has a powerful use of language and voice. Please join me in welcoming Acadia Reynolds. Hello, uh, thank you all. I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my story, Summer Days. From the age of five onwards, my parents sent me off to my grandparents' house during the summer to spend a couple weeks exploring the woods and helping my grandpa with his farm. Those days are defined in my memory by my grandmother's unending attempts to convert me to Christianity. She would read aloud in the Bible when I was in the room, and the t TV was constantly playing grainy recordings of Tam Tammy Faye Mesner, at least until Edith found out that Tammy supported LGBT rights. Then Miss Mesner was never seen again. I was raised atheist by my parents, and my mother had forbidden Edith from taking me to church, but Edith just got around that by sending me to Sunday school. The teacher, James, had a strange fascination with hell. He spent hours describing the tortures that souls underwent there, making funny noises that are meant to replicate the sound of screams and bones breaking. Edith told him about my atheism in a whisper, like it was some dirty secret. With one hand held up to her face, sheltering her words from prying eyes, and the other holding my hand. He called me up to the front of the class, standing in front of the room with his eye arms crossed while the five or so other little children in the room stared at me. Edith never called him by his name. He was just a man of God. That's what he was for sure, a man of God with a real sense for justice. So he put his hands on my shoulder and told the class that I was already damned. <laughs> She's gonna be flayed, James said, not looking at me. He pressed his fingers into my arm, hard enough to hurt. They're gonna peel her skin like an onion. He pointed straight up to God, right? The class mumbled an affirmative. He wasn't satisfied with that. Right, James said louder, nodding when he got a chorus of agreements. He let go of me, pushed me back towards my seat, then clapped his hands together in front of my face. All of your bones crushed just like that. He said it quietly, just for me. I went back to Edith's house that day and told her that I changed my mind. I believed in God, just so long as I hadn't, didn't have to go back. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good evening, and welcome to the Dock Street Theater. My name is Sam Easley, and as a board member, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's conversation. In his book, The Real Rainbow Row, Harlan Green traces Charleston's queer history, unearthing 350 years of the community's suppression and contributions to our city. In James Kerchick's book, Secret City shines a vibrant light into the shadows of decades of gay culture in Washington, D.C., and the skills our community needed to survive. Together tonight with interlocutor Bill Goldstein, author-interviewer for NBC's Weekend Today, Harlan and James will discuss why both books are not just LGBTQ plus histories, but a part of America's hidden histories. Thank, thank you all. I hope this microphone, which I've now knocked off twice, <laughs> is, is, is working. Uh, you can't have a long wire on a short person. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, thank you very much, Sam, and uh, thank you, Diana, for inviting me once again to be here in Charleston, and I'm glad to be here with Harlan and, and Jamie. Um, so what we'll talk about are the, the differences between Washington and Charleston, I think, but also a lot about what Secret City and The Real Rainbow Row have in common in uncovering a history that isn't too often paid attention to, um, and that both are pioneering books in exploring uh, the hidden history of the cities that they are focused on. And so what I'd like to have you each talk about just sort of in lieu of an opening statement, uh, first of all, that's Jamie and this is Harlan, I mean, just to <laughs> make sure everybody knows, um, is how you, got the idea, what you wanted to do in writing what Jamie says about gay people in Washington, a uh, uh, history of a people who are hiding in plain sight. So how do you write that history when it's hidden and yet in plain sight? What's, what's the process by which you sort of begin to shape a story that is hidden? If that's a question you can answer. <laughs> Alphabetical order, Mr. Okay. Green and Mr. So, uh, so you, I, it's, it, I don't think it's coincidence that both of us are gay. You know, um, it, it's, you know, only on the weekends. weekends. Only on the weekends. Yeah. 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 Well, every other day for me. <laughs> but so then, I think, at least for me, you know, I knew I was here, um, but nobody said I was here. And just growing up in this city, you know, being the inheritor of stories. Um, but then, you know, and again, making, um, I think we're also Jewish, um, and, you know, you, you see those um, books of prayer, you've got, you know, the text up here and the commentary down there, and I think, you know, the kind of gay stories were kind of that way. There was the real text up here, and then there was the subtext down on the bottom that had a sort of a gay um, element to it, and then just hearing that and um, being drawn to history and just accumulating things and accumulating things and accumulating things. And then you realize, oh, I've accumulated a lot of things. I better do something with it. And then, you know, the time was right. Um, so, um, you know, so again, and you're also, you know, you're tired of the cliches of living in the shadows and twilight and stuff like that. And then you realize, gosh, it's 2022 or something like that. You know, I bet you could probably get away with um, spilling some of the secrets. Well, so when you talk about you know, obviously, you know, you're here and you knew th these stories of at least of your own life and your own time. You're also telling in this book stories of many decades ago, even even centuries ago. And so are those stories that you inherited through conversation? I mean, is that, you know, just a lineage back that, that gay people, LGBTQ people are telling themselves here that, or is this also research that that you found these earlier. And I'll be brief and give Jamie his, t it's also standing on the shoulders of the people who came before you, Jonathan Ned Katz, mm -hmm. you know, who writes Gay American History. And then I hope most of you don't do what I do is stay up late at night Googling, you know, and going down rabbit holes. And that's where you find a lot of that as well too. Um, you know, just trying to um, put search words together and stumbling upon things that you didn't know existed. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think actually the contrast between my, and I didn't know our, uh, Jewish and gay identities is actually really key here because when you grow up Jewish or black or Italian American or Irish American, you learn the history of your people through your relatives. 
right, through your parents. Um, when you're gay, you have to find it out yourself. Mm -hmm. And when I moved to Washington, I was always very interested in political history, American history. And my first job out of college was working at a magazine in Washington. And soon after I arrived there, I realized that this was, first of all, a very gay city, Washington, D.C. Um, and the more I learned about it, I realized it had been a very gay city for a long time. We can get into that later. Um, but it was also a city where, up until very recently, it was really dangerous to be gay. Um, and in fact, it was more dangerous to be a, a, a gay than it was to be a communist. Um, so Washington, D.C. was simultaneously, you could say, one of the gayest, if not the gayest cities in, in America before San Francisco, um, yet also the most anti-gay city in America because there are all these purges, which is sort of appropriate when you consider it that Washington's also the capital of hypocrisy uh, in the United States, that it could be these, these, these two things equally. And so I just realized that there was this, um, this thread, uh, this common thread that went from, well, my book starts around the FDR administration, the New Deal, the rise of the national security state really is when the book begins, because that's when homosexuality transforms from being just or merely a sin, a crime, and a mental disorder, it also becomes a national security threat around World War II because America is becoming a global power and there's this fear that gay people can be blackmailed. Um, and the, but there's this thread of, homo of, of, the, of a secret history that goes all the way from the New Deal really until the end of the Cold War. And it, and it goes through every presidential administration, every phenomena from McCarthyism to the African-American Civil Rights Movement to Watergate to there's a, there's a chapter on Iran-Contra. I mean, there's just a, there's a gay um, factor in all these stories that had never been told before, and so I wanted to put them all t together. And so you begin with Sumner Wells, um, and I mean, there's obviously other history in the book, but one of the things that's so astounding about your book is the recovered biographies and fates of all of these people who are, whose names might be known, or some of whom whose, whose names are known, and, and the roles they played in the administrations, even as they were, uh, uh, well, finally cut, you know, like mm. cut out of it because of the political cost of, of employing them. Uh, and, and were these people that you knew were gay? I mean, how did you find the stories of the people that you wanted to focus on? Because some of them are well known, Sumner Wells is yeah, well Sumner known. Yeah, Sumner Wells, who was basically the top diplomat in the FDR administration and is the victim of the first real gay scandal in American politics uh, in 1941. He's riding on the presidential train, and he gets drunk. By the way, alcohol is a huge impact in a lot of these stories, a lot of alcoholics, a lot of gay men sort of, um, you know, being driven to drink and then behaving in ways that they would later come to regret. He would, you know, importune some of the, um, actually there was a mention here of A. Philip Randolph and the, uh, sleeping, call, uh, the sleeping Car Porters Union um, in the previous talk, uh, this, Sumner Wells would importune some of the members of that union on the presidential train, and this got him into trouble. Um, and interestingly, FDR actually stuck by him for two years because he wanted to keep him, because um, he really valued his, his service. He would actually shrug it off when people would come to him and say, you gotta get rid of this guy, he's a, he's a sexual deviant. FDR would joke, well, he's not doing it on government time, is he? Um, <laughs> so the reaction, the way that the presidents dealt, I mean, each president sort of had either a gay friend or a gay aide, or there was a gay scandal. And you learn a lot about the presidents through the ways that they behaved in these, um, in these incidents. Um, when you, you talk about alcohol, I mean, one of the, one of the things that also is, runs through the stories that you tell, um, uh, many of them, and then also uh, in, in your book, Harlan, when there are uh, various trials or people are arrested, I mean, it's the, the danger, but also the inevitability for a lot of these very isolated, lonely men who in many cases are married also, and um, of, of getting arrested you know, for public sex or for even the idea that they might be having public, you know, like in a place where people uh, might have been having sex, a, a men's room or something like that, and they're not always even actually having sex. So if you could talk about how 
what the risks were, I mean, I, I don't think it's, it's so far uh, from our own time or our own history. I mean, that, uh, that the risk of being who they were was so great and there was no place really for people to be who they were. We can you say a little bit about sure. I mean, some of know, the cases you talk about in, in your sure, book. Sure, you know, Washington might have had its administrations, you know, where you're in and you're out. And Charleston, you know, is, you know, always has been a small city. Um, and there is that great desire to belong in this city. Um, and, and I think that was one thing, you know, um, to be the other, you know, has been a propelling of Charleston's history. And I think, you know, especially if you're a white male, um, and that always encouraged, it's always so interesting to see that if you were already on the outside, if you were African American, it was, despite what you say about the church, it was almost easier to be gay and out as an African American often because you were already, you know, beyond and excluded, you already were the other. And I think that was the fear that drove um, a lot of these men, you know, to be closeted because they thought they would lose status. They thought they would lose everything. And, and they were tightly, very much repressed. And Charleston, of course, is a drinking city. Um, and, um, and not just Josephine Pinkney, Pinkney calling it a sea drinking city. It's you know an alcoholic drinking city. Um, and that was always often the prompt that would allow these men, or you know, they would take down their guard. And sometimes to their delight and sometimes to their detriment, they really could lose their family. And there are stories of that and they would lose their lives because the fear that they could not belong anymore. And the, the, the arrests and, and, well, in one particular case that you talk about in 1958, the murder of, I mean, what are people in Charleston, in the newspaper, I mean, you talk about this in your book and I, I want Jamie to talk about this too, what the press coverage of, of these incidents when either famous men or administration officials or local people are uh, arrested or in, in your case murdered, uh, the, the press coverage is so venomous in, and, and it, the, the quotations from the, the newspapers are almost worse than even the, 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 the sadness that you feel for, for the person, it just compounds everything. I mean, so if you could talk about the, the public response to this, these events, and how you, in doing your research, find these newspaper accounts. And yeah. what, and I'll pass ahead, it to Jamie ahead. really quickly. I mean, the press was pretty much the handmaid, and oftentimes, you know, the you know there was a, a murder in 1958 um, called the Candlestick Murder, and the victim was trial tried in the court of public opinion in the newspaper first, and the perpetrator, the perp was you know, portrayed as a nice, clean young man, and this was during the McCarthy period. And the interesting, th um, and so then the newspapers, the press really did hound, and they really did, again, um, cast people out. But the interesting thing one that I discovered reading your book, Jamie, is that in the 1960s, for some reason, the local paper, the News and Courier, did this terrible expose of that there might be, you know, homosexuals in the city of Charleston, and you know, they 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 instilled fear, and you know, there are not a lot of them, but the one on the bus might be this fellow on the bus might be one of them, and I couldn't figure out why the city of Charleston did it. And then reading your book, I realized that the Washington Post apparently in the early 60s did a fairly benign um, um, you know, look at the hidden gay world. Yeah. And, and I know now that the editors here read the benign Washington Post one and thought, mm. oh, there's an idea for a story, <laughs> but they flipped it. Yeah, the media is a huge part of my book. Um, the whole concept of outing uh, which is the forced you know, disclosure of a gay person's identity. I read about the first political outing um, which happened six months after Pearl Harbor. Uh, there was a senator who was alleged to have been patronizing a male brothel near the Brooklyn Navy Yard in New York City that was supposedly rife with Nazi spies. Um, and this story was published, and it's interesting, I mentioned it was six months after Pearl Harbor. That shows you the impact of national security and the fear of, of, of national security on the nation's psyche and the impact it would have on our understanding of homosexuality, right? Because the accusation was, oh, there's this senator who's on the Naval Committee in the Senate, and he's hanging around this house of ill repute near um, a, mil a military installation, and there's Nazi spies hanging out there. 
Um, and they teased out, and, 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 and they, therefore this man could be susceptible to blackmail, and he can't serve his country because of this. Um, it turns out to be a case of mistaken identity. Um, the senator was not the man who was uh, allegedly at this, at this brothel. Uh, his name is David Walsh. He was a conservative Democrat from Massachusetts. Um, but his career was destroyed, and he lost his next um, election. And yeah, absolutely throughout the McCarthy era, when there's this sort of twinning in the public mind of communism and homosexuality, you have the media uh, really feeding into this national hysteria around sexual deviance was the, was the expression. And really up until the 1980s, you know, the Washington Post and its obituaries would not publish um, the partners, the names of the partners of men who died of AIDS. You know, they wouldn't acknowledge them in the, as, as partners. They would say, you know, friend or companion or whatever. It actually, it took a lot of lobbying and angry letters from the gay community to get the Post to, to change its, its policy. And the Post was, a, you know, a relatively liberal newspaper. Um, so, you know, homosexuality was very much a salacious topic. And at the same time, it was often one that you couldn't write about explicitly. I mean, the, the, the story I just mentioned about David Walsh, the senator who was outed, they didn't even use the word homosexual because that word was not a word you could use in polite company. You know, it's the love that dare not speak its name, right? That's how terrible homosexuality was. They would, they would allude to it. They would say, oh, this senator was spotted at a, an all-male uh, house of ill repute. They would use all these kind of codes and, and sort of roundabout ways of, of describing what was going on. The, um, I mean, that story that you tell was astounding because that's obviously, a, we, we've forgotten about that. What, what's interesting to me as we're talking now, I mean, what, what, what you're saying about homosexuality as it was perceived as a national security threat, um, which was, there was no evidence really that it was a, a particular national security threat any more than you know, someone's, you know, straight man's drinking or, being unfaithful. Well, the Defense life. Department did a study in the early 1990s around the Don't Ask, Don't Tell debate, and they analyzed about 120 cases of espionage um, of Americans. Six of them were gay, but not a single one of them committed treason on account of under, under inducement of blackmail. They did it for money or ideology or whatnot. So there actually wasn't a single case of a, of a gay person um, you know, violating their security clearance because they were gay. I mean, one of the things, so, so uh, there are two points I, I want to make or have you address. I mean, we're talking about this as uh, you, you say until the, at some point in the 1980s, just as in the New York Times, they wouldn't identify people as, as uh, partners or obviously later could use the word husband or wife. But um, in so many ways, I mean, the, the demonization of, of gay people uh, Continues. I mean, it's 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 not as if uh, you know, Speaker Johnson is all that far from what is being said. I mean, the, the terms are different. I mean, he can talk openly about homosexuality. I mean, but the reviling of gay people. I mean, they're not being drummed out of the government. But it's not as if it's any more hospitable a political atmosphere with certain elements of uh, current politics than it was. In the in the fifties, in many ways, I mean, can you can you speak to how this history shapes what we should be thinking about today with anti LGBTQ laws or anti trans laws, or uh, in fact, what evangelical Christians like Mike Johnson, who are in positions of power, think and feel about homosexuality? Do you want to? Um, that's a tough one, but um, it it's funny the language has, has almost shifted just shifted. I mean, yeah, we can use the words now, but um, that's not necessarily giving us a freedom. It's, but you take, you always take the weakest. And um, nowadays it seems to be trans youth. Um, and, you know, we didn't have, we weren't talking trans issues in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, or even 80s. And now that's the latest bugaboo. So, um, you know, I think anyone who writes history, you know, realizes that, you know, it's, you know, the widening gyre, I um, mean, you know, the cycles go on. And, you, you know, we all think, you know, the, the terrible cliche, you think we're going to learn from the past. Nope, we just keep repeating it. And um, 
but there is some hope in actually writing it down and proving it to people that we have been this way before and we've, we've won this over before. So there seems to be something in the human psyche you know, or, or a tool that politicians or someone's always going to use um, to create the other, um, you know, to use it. Everyone's, they seem to be searching for some kind of stick that they can use you know, to, um, you know, to, um, to, to raise some kind of, you know, you know, it's the Frankenstein thing, the, the, the torches and searching for something and you know, coming together to hate somebody. And you know, it's, it's a dismal thing, but I don't see a way out of it except to keep outing it and being transparent about it. One of the things I realized in researching and writing this book is that um, there's a consistent pattern in American politics and probably in other countries as well of ascribing um, sexual deviancy to your political enemies. So when we're fighting World War II against the Nazis, there's actually two um, reports commissioned by, uh, done by the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which is the predecessor to the CIA, where they go on at length about how the Nazis are maybe a gay cabal, and that it's all these gay guys, uh, these, these sexually deviant men who are kind of getting together and you know, waging war on the world. Um, these were done, these reports were, were done by very well-credentialed Harvard you know, doctors. And there's actually multiple, I've, I was going through the archives at the FDR library, there's like multiple reports coming in from spies and from correspondents um, attesting to this fear that the Nazis might be gay. And that Adolf Hitler himself might be gay and that the stab in the back um, theory, which is his you know, claim that Germany was stabbed in the back by socialists and Jews, that there might be some kind of latent uh, homoerotic subtext to this. <laughs> um, but then, you know, we win World War II, and then we're in the Cold War against the communists, and you have Joe McCarthy making a connection between communism and homosexuality. And no one seems to stop and say, well, wait, weren't the gays, weren't they, you were telling us they were fascists a couple of years ago. Now they're, home, now they're communists? Um, you know, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie JFK, the Oliver Stone movie, which is based on the only prosecution in the JFK assassination it was of a gay businessman in New Orleans named Clay Shaw. In that case, the theory of the case, um, which was prosecuted by a, a madman prosecutor named Jim Garrison, who's portrayed as a hero in Oliver Stone's film by Kevin Costner, his theory of that case was that it was a right-wing homosexual thrill killing. That these group of right-wing homosexuals in New Orleans who were upset that, the, that Kennedy had failed to overthrow Castro in the Bay of Pigs, that they wanted to assassinate the most handsome man in the world. And that this would be some sort of thrill for them, sort of like the Leopold and Loeb murder, which was a famous murder involving two young gay men 40 years earlier. So it's, and then what is QAnon today, right? It's not, it's not necessarily homosexuality, but it's, it's that our elites are sexual deviants, that they're pedophiles, right? So this is a common recurring theme in the kind of American political imagination. The, the other point I wanted to make about the, the national security threat, and I hope you, you, Jamie, in particular can talk about it, but also Harlan, is that, um, the the idea of the, the that, that gay people are a threat, but it's often gay people who are, if not necessarily leading the administration in the way Roy Cohn, I mean, as a gay person, led investigations. They there are gay people who are secret, you know, secret about their homosexuality in the Eisenhower administration, in the Reagan administration, in that that are fostering anti-gay policies. And if, if you can talk about the, the, divided psycho, psych, the divided psychology of that, I mean, the, what, what they're willing to sacrifice for political ideals that are separate from what we would consider gay rights, which don't figure for them at all. I mean, and, and those people are so fascinating to me. Um, the, the people who are divided against themselves and seem to see very little um, contradiction in that, or for m many of them don't see a contradiction in that. Well, yes, we haven't mentioned J. Edgar Hoover yet, and um, 
you know, I didn't come across any solid evidence that he was gay. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence that he was gay. He was a lifelong bachelor. He had a very, uh, speaking of bachelorhood, uh, a fascinating topic in my book. I mean, I, I mentioned earlier why do so many gay men come to Washington? If you think about it, what, uh, if you're working for a senator, a congressman, you're an aide on Capitol Hill, you need to be available at all hours of the day. You need to be able to pick up that phone at two, 2 in the morning and, you know, fly, to, fly halfway across the country to go to your congressional district. You need to be loyal to your boss. You need to be available. And that is something that, you know, gay men, particularly in this era, are more suited to. If you're in the State Department, the State Department was reputably, you know, full of gays. That's what McCarthy was saying. There was a little truth to that, right? Because if you're thinking about it, um, you can kind of get away with being a bachelor in the State Department. You're traveling from post to post every few years. It's a good excuse not to have a family. Um, you know, incidentally, maybe the, maybe the Senate delegation from this country might have something to say about, from, from this state, might have something to say about bachelorhood. <laughs> um, um, but this has been, this has been, I'm not, I'm not casting any aspersions about anybody. I'm not. <laughs> um, but, um, where did we begin? J. Edgar Hoover. Well, you brought it J. Edgar up. J. Edgar Hoover. J., uh, <laughs> J. Edgar Hoover, confirmed bachelor, right? Very close relationship with his personal relationship with his aide, Clyde Tolson. They're eating at the Mayflower every day. They go on vacations with one another. You mentioned Roy Cohn. There's a number of men in the Reagan administration that I talk about. Look, Washington was a pressure cooker city. And, um, you know, I think there was a sense of maybe overcompensation for some of these men that they didn't want to draw attention to themselves. So they would maybe direct the fire elsewhere, right? So if Roy Cohn can get up there and also, Roy Cohn was Jewish, right, at a time of a lot of anti-Semitism. So what does Roy Cohn do? He goes and prosecutes the Rosenbergs and sends them to the electric chair, right? Which is to say, you know, no one should doubt my loyalty to this country as a Jew. I'm sending these Jewish communist traitors to the electric chair. And I think there's a similar psychology going on with his role next to McCarthy going after homosexuals. You know, no one, no one can question my sexuality because I am more rock-ribbed um, standing up against these sexual deviants than, than anybody else. Do you want to talk about political office holders in South Carolina? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, but I won't. Um, <laughs> but you know, I think you can, you can also um, extend it, you know, to the religious spheres, it, sphere as well too. You know, think of all the defrocked ministers and not just the politicians. You know, who seem to. Um, you know, South Carolina's got a famous one who recently, you know, was running a camp for, um, you know, for conversion therapy, um, you know, getting, you know, young men who don't want to be gay, um, you know, and curing them. And often these are the people themselves, you know, who are, um, you know, um, that are, they're guilty or of the same thing. And again, it's the same thing. So it's even beyond the political arena, you're getting into the religious um, arena as well too. And again, there's something, you know, the best, the best, the best defense is a good offense, you know. And again, draw attention. You know, look at this bright, shiny object over here. Don't look at my spangled underwear, you know, that I'm secretly wearing. Speaking of that, there's a book about um, sort of men who engaged in what was called the tea room trade, sex, sex in public bathrooms and whatnot. And the author of that came up with the term to describe what a lot of these men would publicly proclaim about themselves. It was called the breastplate of righteousness. I think that that's, that's a very kind of vivid encapsulation of, of this psychosis, if you want to call it. So in, in both your books, um, I mean, 1981 is an important moment uh, in, in gay history, in American history, uh, the coincidence of Reagan's uh, inauguration and the first cases of AIDS, which are reported in May of 81. So he's inaugurated in, in January of 1981. And I was struck in your book, you, you talk about various uh, gay newspapers um, at, at various times. And there was a, a, a newspaper called Gay Charleston, which began publishing in February 1981. Um, and I was so moved by the what you quote from the I think it's the inaugural page, you know, the, the beginning pages uh, uh, about um, what they say. And it, so Charleston, so this is published in February of 1981. Charleston is a proud city, 
I'm not sure who I is. I feel, however, it was a man named Holt, is that? George that? Holt. Right, George Holt was the editor. I feel, however, that the community of gay people cannot be so characterized that it's not a proud uh, community, the concept of which, pride, is important for a healthy community. And obviously he wasn't referring to it in, in the way that uh, AIDS would come to overshadow. But so if you could both talk about the shifts in some of the issues that you address, Jamie, and then also about life here in South Carolina, in Charleston, as AIDS cases begin to emerge, first a very small number, uh, but how politics, how the, the coincidence of the Reagan administration and the emergence of AIDS shapes gay history and the history of the epidemic itself, and then also in Charleston, how the emerging very few at first cases shape what's happening here in the city as it responds to AIDS. Right. Um, go ahead. I mean, you can tie it back to the media as to what you said before. You know, we all said that the media was stoking the flames of, you know, of homophobia. But ironically, once the gay press starts, you know, here in Charleston in 81 and certainly earlier um, nationwide, the advocate and a variety of things like that, the gay press then becomes the voice. And then, you know, because of that one newspaper there starting in the 1980s, um, you know, um, LGBTQ history in Charleston shifts from an individual to an institution. You know, there is a voice. The media does actually expound that. Um, and it creates an us, you know, all of a sudden now we have a voice. We have a paper um, that's trumpeting our cause. But when AIDS first started here, like everywhere else, there was denial. Um, but you know, um, you know, nothing like um, persecution to um, make something thrive. I mean, look at Christianity. Um, and so then that's ultimately what happened, you know, out of this deep tragedy, I'm certainly not the first one saying it, you're writing the biography, you know, of Larry Kramer, um, you know, out of this great tragedy comes this great strength. You know, again, you know, we were saying earlier that, you know, it's gotta, be, for some reason, it's only gay people who write gay history. And at this point in, in the city of Charleston, there were certainly allies. And as Joe Hall, who I quote there, saying it was the lesbians, lesbians, lesbians who were, who were, who were um, heeding the call, you know, helping their gay brothers, et cetera. But those, you know, out of that fear came, you know, an incredible forge of bravery. And, you know, you had to go to the brink to come back. So, you know, it is one of those great ironies, you know, that it took a tragedy um, you know, to create this gay consciousness and to fight back because the straight press was not going to do it, and except for a few allies, the straight politicians were not going to do it either. Yeah, what AIDS does is it brings a lot of gay people out of the closet, not by their own volition in many cases in Washington, because you have all these men who are suddenly getting sick and they have to leave their jobs or they're, or they're going off and, and dying. Uh, and they're dropping like flies. Um, you also have, again, you have, you have a gay press now, which you didn't have in the 50s, really, or the 60s. And it's now the gay press that is doing the outing mm -hmm. of men in positions of power whom the gay press accuses of being hypocrites, right? So the first real um, outing in, um, by, a, by a gay publication is of a man named Terry Dolan, who was probably one of the most powerful, influential conservatives in Washington, D.C. He started the first PAC, the first political action committee, called the National Conservative Political Action Committee. His brother was Ronald Reagan's chief speechwriter. They were probably the two most powerful brothers in Washington since the Kennedys. And Terry um, was allied with the religious right, with Jerry Falwell. Um, and he, there were sort of inklings that he might be gay in some newspapers. There were sort of suggestions. But then in, in 1983, I believe, uh, there's a book written by a gay author that has a whole chapter um, on Terry Dolan's secret gay life. It's then excerpted in the Washington Blade. And what's interesting is that the whole conservative world that he was a part of, they just ignored it. They pretended it wasn't true. Because it was the gay media. The, still, you still had the mainstream media would not publish a story like, like, like this. Um, and it's not until after he dies of AIDS that the Washington Post then does a full sort of investigation and expose, um, which drives 
Anthony Dolan, his brother, who's Ronald Reagan's chief speechwriter, extremely mad, and he and I document this whole sad story in my book. He he takes out a two-page advertisement in the Washington Times uh, to publish this this 8,000-word screed against Ben Bradley and the Washington Post and his, all this homosexual intrigue in the Washington Post newsroom that Ben Bradley can't turn his back on anyone, apparently. I mean, just crazy <laughs> stuff for a white the chief speechwriter to be writing. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, I, I think that the Reagan section of my book is the most uh, dramatic and exciting yeah. because you have this you know, conservative administration that's put in place, comes to power through the assistance of um, the support of evangelical Christians who are a new rising political force, and you have the fact that the Reagans are kind of surrounded by gay people, Nancy in particular. I mean, the photo insert in my book is an entire page, and it's, all, it's, just, it's entitled All the First Ladies Men, and it's just her with you know, Jimmy Galanos and her hairdresser and her, and her friends and, and whatnot, and um, in fact, I think there's a slide, if we could pull that up, um, do we have one? Yeah. Oh yeah, so I don't know if you can read that, but this was um, Rock Hudson, who you may recall, was one of the most famous matinee idols, actors in America. He died of AIDS in 1986, and he was, he was the first celebrity to die of AIDS. And he really put AIDS on the map in a way that it hadn't been before. He was close friends of, of the Reagans. And when I was at the Reagan Library, I found the draft of the public statement that Ronald and Nancy published after his death. And this is in the president's own handwriting. You can see the edits he makes. So Nancy and I are profoundly saddened. He crosses out profoundly. Our memories will also be of his. He changes that to the passive voice. He will be remembered for his. And then this sentence, he was our friend and we will miss him greatly, crossed out. So you just see in this one little example, right? The president going through and crossing out any personal connection that he and Nancy had to this very high profile public AIDS victim, um, which I just thought was very revealing. And this was in 1986, so you hear all these stories about how Reagan was, you know, he had Alzheimer's by that time. I don't, that's not a guy with Alzheimer's. I mean, he, he was very de deliberate in his, in his um, changes to that. And this is still before he even has given a speech yeah. about AIDS, yes. which isn't until To the next year, 87, right. So you can yeah. imagine AIDS is first discovered in 1981 he mentions it in a press conference, I believe, in 1984. In the, it's in the book. But he doesn't give a speech about it until 19... I mean, can you imagine if COVID came out and, no, and the president didn't say anything about it for six right. years? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the things, I mean, writing about Larry Kramer as, as COVID began is you, you do realize, or I saw, and not only because Dr. Fauci was involved in both uh, administrations or you know, working in... in in Washington on both diseases, is that um, a Republican administration does not look upon AIDS or COVID initially as a true public health threat. And so it's not, not being mentioned, and yet still the administration is not gearing its efforts in a, in a sense of, of an idea that that in fact public health is a responsibility of the administration. And uh, however the public is defined, I mean, whether it's a small group who have a communicable disease, at least at first, um, or, uh, or just looking at, at this epidemic as something that, that really needs to be addressed by government. So I do think that the, the, there's a similarity in the response to the, the epidemic as a, an abdication of real uh, government responsibility for, for this. But, um, but that's, you know, to some degree, a coincidence. I mean, would COVID have been different if there had been a Democratic president who can, who can say, I mean, who believed in the idea of public health as a, as a you know, public health care or you know, something like that? And would AIDS have been different if Jimmy Carter had been elected in, reelected in 19... 80, where already gay people are a public, a small but still a public element of the Democratic mm. coalition, still very minor. But uh, I mean, obviously, no one has an answer to those to those questions. Um, but uh, the story that you tell of Tony Dolan and his brother Terry, I mean, it's so riveting in the book, and his madness really. I mean, it, it, it's a kind of 
insanity, I mean, as he's pursuing the post and then the, the, the Washington Times, and then I think it's after that that the Washington Times is publishing these long exposés of other people. I mean, isn't there a, a, a big effort by the Washington Times to uncover homosexuality? The Washington Times what? then, yes, the Washington, which is the, the Mooney newspaper because it's owned by the Unification Church. Um, they, in the summer of 1989, they go on this, um, uh, it's almost like a white whale that they're chasing, uh, of this, this supposed lobbyist named Craig Spence, who was leading tours of the White House, midnight tours of the White House supposedly with male prostitutes. None of this was really true, but they turned it, in fact, in the words of their own editor, they said, we're going to make this into Watergate. Um, and they published something like, you know, five dozen stories or something on this minor Washington admittedly colorful, strange figure. Um, but yes, the Washington Times did not uh, cover itself in glory, I would say. And in fact, the Washington Times, interestingly, they would use the word homosexual. I mean, you, the, the word homosexual has sort of gone out of favor. You know, you don't, you don't really hear it that much anymore. It's clinical. Um, and I believe the New York Times replaced homosexual with gay in the 80s, 87, 88? Yeah, like 86, 87, I mean. Washington Times was using homosexual until at least 2008 or nine, I think maybe even 2010. And they would, off, they would also, they would, they would say homosexual marriage in scare quotes. That's how they would re refer to gay marriage. So. Um, the, the, now that you mentioned. Speaking of, I mean, they, they know a lot about weddings at the Unification <laughs> Church <laughs> newspaper. So they don't allow mass gay weddings no. now. I mean, right. uh, um, uh, and who would make the cake for it? I mean, it's a, it's a question. Um, That's a court case. <laughs> um, the uh, when when you mention same-sex uh, marriage, weddings. I mean, one of the things that's interesting in your book is the very early same-sex marriages that are being performed here. So, I, if you could talk about the person who does that and what his role was in uh, Charleston and South Carolina gay history. I mean, yeah. he's a very interesting figure. So um, many people might remember George Exo, um, who was the minister of the Unitarian Church here and came as close to any um, serving clergy in the city of Charleston to actually you know, be out. Um, he, you know, he opened the congregation in that, to, to gay people in that first gay Charleston um, newspaper, they actually advertised basically saying the Unitarian Church is open, um, you know, to LGBTQ people. And um, so George um, was very, again, someone from off, and that's often the case here, and I guess with Washington it's the same too. So many people who are not Native who are coming in yes. and making history. And that was one of the things. George was one of the many people who came here and brought change with them. It's almost like, you know, they came in and someone comes in, you could feel the little cold eddy of air behind them. And he was the one, you know, that came from someplace beyond um, and brought um, some kind of openness and some kind of acceptance to the city of Charleston. The fact that he could do it from the pulpit certainly helped. He was one of the powers behind the newspaper as well, too. Um, and so then, and then, you know, he, was started all of these societies, you know, trying to get um, professional men together. And it, unfortunately, always men, women always seem to be left out. Um, but again, he was just one of many. Um, and, you know, and then they've been eclipsed by the next generation who've come in and changed things. Um, and um, he went off to a unfortunate um, end where he became known as Reverend Death, that George would, um, 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 do euthanasia on people whether they had a terminal diagnosis or not. So um, got into a little trouble for that. And I always wondered um, <laughs> if, it, because he was, it he started was, out so well. Right, right. You know, if it was if it was the HIV crisis here that turned him toward death. You know, because he started seeing it all the time. And again, the local papers here refused to um, put the partner's name. Um, you know, when people died. So we're going to go to questions from the audience in, in, a, in a minute or two. I have one more thing to ask. So there are two microphones, I think, and uh, they'll be on either aisle. And when you give your, ask your question, um, uh, try to make it as brief as possible, but, um, uh, so we can get to as many people as possible. But also, uh, if, if, um, if 
people can't hear it, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Um, but I, I wanted to ask before we go to questions uh, from the audience, if, if both of you could choose from the, 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 the people, the character, I mean, I, they're nonfiction books, so I don't want to call them characters, but the, the, the people in your book, I mean, because, Jamie, in your book, I mean, there's so many heartbreaking stories, I mean, and, and uh, Billy Sippel, I mean, Bob Waldron, um, Walter Jenkins, um, Craig Spence, I mean, I'm just, I wrote the ones I wrote <laughs> down. Um, and, and so if you could just, I mean, it doesn't have to be one of them, but who exemplifies what you were hoping to tell and hoping to recover in Secret City, and then also if you could talk about a historical figure. Well, probably the most inspiring story uh, was a man named Frank Kameny, who it's been said of him that he was the Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall, and Martin Luther King of the gay movement. He was um, a PhD astronomer from Harvard who was working for the US Army Map Service in 1957, which was basically the predecessor to the Geospatial Intelligence Agency. So they're basically mapping the skies for the US Army at the, at the height of the space race. And just two months after the Soviets launched Sputnik into space, he's summoned back from an, an observatory in Hawaii and he's fired on the spot because they have evidence that, he, that he's gay. He was arrested on a, on a homosexual solicitation charge uh, the previous year. And he becomes the first person to challenge his firing. You know, up until that point, thousands of people had been, had been let go, forced out. He, he says, this is wrong. You know, I'm not going to stand for this. I'm going to actually sue the federal government. And not even the ACLU would take his case, okay, which again goes to show you that it was worse to be a homosexual than a communist. If you were a communist or accused of communism, the ACLU would defend you. They would not defend a homosexual in 1957. So he has to file his own legal brief. Uh, the Supreme Court doesn't hear his case, but he goes on to found uh, really the first sustained gay rights organization in America. It's called the Mattachine Society of Washington. Uh, he holds the first protest for gay rights outside the White House in 1965, this is four years before the much more famous Stonewall Uprising, which is commonly believed, erroneously in my opinion, to be the start of the gay rights movement. He's instrumental in getting the American Psychiatric Association to remove homosexuality from its list of mental disorders in 1973. Uh, he plays a crucial role in getting the United States government to allow gay people to work for the federal, uh, to, to, to um, uh, veto its, its ban on gay people from working for the federal government, which President Eisenhower had implemented in 1953. He gets the federal government, the Civil Service Commission, to overturn that in 1975. He plays a crucial role in, in getting gay people the right to have a security clearance, which, which President Clinton wouldn't repeal until 1995. So this is a guy whose life is just, um, you know, it could have gone one way, right? He could have just drunk himself into oblivion, which is something that a lot of gay men, unfortunately, did at that time. But he had, some, he had something about him that just said, I'm not going to stand for this. And I'm, you know, he, he, I, got, I got to know him a bit. And I, he died in 2011, and I was, or 13, I think. Um, or, no, it was 2011. I, I interviewed him just a year before he died. And he would often say, um, if the world and I disagree on something, because he was a scientist, he said, I'll stop, and I'll consider it, and I'll do the research. But if I'm right, and I decide I'm right, I'm going to, persist. And this was a guy who changed the world. I mean, he, he totally, not single-handedly, right, but he did more, I think, to change um, popular, the popular conception of gay people than I think than, than anyone else. If it wasn't for Frank, then, then, then you, you, we wouldn't be on this stage. There's a wonderful picture. Of him. I'm not sure if it's in your book, but there are pictures. There's this, uh, at the first uh, gay pride march in New York a year after uh, Stonewall. Uh, he's yeah. carrying the sign "Gay is good." Gay is good. Yeah. It's just it's such a great picture. And then of course with Obama when Obama. Yes. Obama apologized on behalf of the federal government so, to Frank. Yeah. So. Um, and for me, I mean, Kameny's name really does echo. Um, and I think I wrote the book not for the heroes, and some heroes are named Leonard Matlovich. Again, people from off who 
who lived here, who went off to change the world. But the stories that really got to me and that resonate most to me are the nameless ones. Um, I think about the um, right after the Civil War in 1868 when the city of Charleston, like many other cities across the country, makes it illegal for a person to appear in the clothes of uh, the opposite gender. Um, and so then, you know, trying to find African American history, um, LGBTQ history is very difficult. But well, they're not exactly nameless. We know what they were called in the police reports, like Sarah in quotation marks. And these are African-American men who somehow survived slavery and then immediately after the Civil War embraced their identities as either trans people or whatever and were arrested you know, on Marion Square um, in women's clothes, obviously sex workers for what would have been the Citadel at the time, the Union troops. I think about the astonishing bravery of those people, nameless people, and I'll pick another nameless person from the 20th century, which I think is the most poignant thing um, in my book. And I was fortunate to find a diary of someone who I ultimately knew, but someone who um, was going to the College of Charleston in the 1930s. And you can see that he internalized everything that was being said in Charleston about gay people. And he writes to his diary, no, I can't be that way. Walk like a man, do this. You know, the love that I had for Richard besmirches him. And um, he, you can see him believing what people tell him. You can see him slowly locking the doors on himself. And then 50 years after the fact, before he dies, he goes back to his diary and he says, why have I not destroyed this diary? And he basically says, because I want some people to benefit from the kind of sadness that I went through. He's so articulate, he's so young, and, um, and the family allowed me to use the diary, but not to use his name. And whether it's a triumph or not, but apparently he never followed on that impulse. He had a family, one of the most respected names in the city of Charleston, who has to remain nameless, and maybe at some point his name will be revealed. Um, and to me, that's the saddest thing. That's the most poignant. And I think it's for the nameless people, you know, who did suffer. You know, we can we can write about the people that we know about, but it's that great black hole of pulling people. You know, that great heaviness of history that I think probably propelled us both to do it. Thank you both. Thank you, Jamie and Harlan. Thank you, and now... Is there time for questions, or no? I hope so. Two minutes. Oh. <laughs> I was, we were told we could oh, go past. over past seven. Yes. Hello. Um, first, gentlemen, thank you all so much for being here. Um, second, and I'll keep this brief, is there hope for today's LGBTQ youth who is seeing things closed down, especially in states like Florida, don't say gay, bathroom laws? Is there hope? that you see in a path forward out of sort of this emerging darkness? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, one thing you do when you read, when you study the gay history is you realize how much, how much worse it was. And so I really, while, while I acknowledge that, that, that there's, a, there's an unfortunate climate in some parts of the country right now, I also counsel against um, hysteria and uh, exaggeration. And, and, and call for people to put things in, in, into perspective. Um, I mean, to be gay in America 100 years ago, or not even 100 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. I mean, I'm not that old, I'm 39 years old. My life has been so much different as a gay person when I was in high school than it is now. I mean, there were no such thing as like young adult books for gay or LGBT kids when I was in high school. And now, there's apparently so many of them that they have to be banned, banned. right? So, <laughs> so, I mean, just put things into perspective. That's, that's all I would say. And read our books so you can understand uh -huh. how much better things have become. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, well, I... Thank you so much. Um, on on uh, the comment you made about uh, FDR, uh, was he influenced by Eleanor and her relationship, or was that he was just being practical? 
Yeah, Eleanor may have may have been a lesbian, um, I, and I, I write about that. She had a very close relationship with a with an AP reporter named Lorena Hickok, who lived in the White House um, at some point. With FDR, it's interesting. It was it, I I don't think that his wife being potentially a lesbian had any impact on his views on homosexuality. I mean, I mentioned before that he was he was defending Sumner Wells, who was his ally, his aide. At the same time. He was assisting the campaign against David Walsh, the senator I mentioned, because even though David Walsh was a Democrat, he was an isolationist, America first Democrat who opposed FDR. And so he was perfectly happy to assist a smear campaign against one of his political rivals on the basis of homosexuality while simultaneously defending his own aide who was also gay. And you see that throughout this book, there's actually very little principle involved in a lot of the ways that politicians behave in relation to these scandals, that it ultimately comes down to, you know, is he my guy or is he on the other side of the aisle? It seems a lot of homophobia is due to the religious right, which also demonizes atheists. I'm wondering if you, in your research, you know what percentage of gays are also atheists? I wouldn't, I wouldn't know the answer to that question. We could ask each of us individually. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, other questions? I'm, I'm, I'm agnostic on that question. <laughs> <laughs> and we have been called goddess. <laughs> yeah. uh, any other questions? No? Well, any questions you have to ask Harlan and Jamie, you can ask as you are having uh, them sign the books that you buy after this session. So thank you, thank Harlan. You. Thank you, Jamie. That was great. Thank you. thank you all, and thank you for coming out tonight and embracing this conversation. There will be a signing in the uh, box office, so please make your way there. Thank you for coming. Thank <laughs> you.